Good afternoon, my name is Samantha Friedman. It is my honor to introduce you to today's commencement speaker. Jonathan Levin, a Philip H. Knight professor and the Dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Jonathan earned a BS in math and a BA in English from Stanford in 1994. He also earned a Master of Philosophy in Economics from Oxford University in 1996 and a PhD in economics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1999. Jonathan Levin is an American ec economist who has made notable contributions in the field of industrial organization and whose research has spanned a range of topics. Jonathan Levin's enthusiasm for the love of learning strongly mirrors what Kahila strives for in each student. Kahila creates a supportive environment so that all students are able to discover their passions and grow as independent young adults. Living in the Silicon Valley has provided us with a melting pot of ideas that allow us to have an innovative, creative, and accepting mindset. For the past four years, we have been urged to follow our many passions and not to be scared to just stick to one, whether that be joining tech club, mishmash, or sports, or even all. Kahila has made us who we are today, well-rounded individuals. Our commencement speaker today is the perfect embodiment of this and shows that anyone can follow their passions no matter how diverse they may be. It is with immense honor and gratitude that I introduce you to Jonathan Levin. Samantha, thank you for that beautiful introduction. What a great honor it is to, to be here today uh, with all of you to celebrate uh, your, um, your students and, uh, and your children and your, your family members who are getting their degrees today. Um, for those of you who are, who are graduating, uh, today is, is really about celebrating all of the work that you've put in and what you've accomplished uh, over the last few years. And you're going to be heading off in a few weeks or a few months to university, to gap years, even to the Israeli Defense Forces. Your lives are going to open up in ways that, uh, that you and, and your parents and your friends uh, really cannot even imagine. And I want to take a, a minute just to recognize uh, how much work goes into getting all of you here. Uh, your families and your teachers really have uh, believed in you. And um, I, want to, I want to honor the people who, who, have, uh, who have gotten you here. Now, I graduated from high school on the East Coast, and it was a time when there was no internet, and you had to pay by the minute for a long-distance phone call. And as my children tell me, the ice had just receded from North America. <laughs> Amy, my wife, who's, who's here today, and I were dating then. And in case you were wondering, we actually did go to our senior prom together. Amy stayed on the East Coast, and I traveled 3,000 miles to go to Stanford, and we, we communicated by writing letters for a few years, and then email was invented. <laughs> so it was a different time. Um, but I want to talk about a few of the experiences that I had at that age that set me on a course to pursue things that have been meaningful to me, and some of the things that all of you might expect in the next few years. And the first point I want to make is about serendipity and about being open to ideas and experiences. So as the dean of the business school at Stanford, one of the best parts of my job is that I get to meet a lot of our former students. And many of them have led very remarkable lives, and they've gone on to be very successful. Some of them have run big companies like General Motors, or they've started companies that it would be impossible to imagine living without, like Nike or DoorDash. <laughs> I definitely could not live without DoorDash. And what's striking is that what set them on their path is very often some seemingly random and unexpected event. So Phil Knight was a student at the business school a long time ago in the 1960s. And as a student, he took a class on entrepreneurship his second year. There was a final project. You had to write a business plan. And he came up with the idea that you could import low-cost athletic shoes from Japan. And you then compete with the high-cost German producers like Adidas that were the market leaders. The other students were not impressed, but he decided to do it anyway, and he founded a company that became Nike. So I didn't found Nike, unfortunately, um, but I also took a class that was very important in setting my direction in life. 
it was an honors calculus class that I took my first quarter in college. Now, I should say that when I got to college, I had no idea what I wanted to study. I had no idea how I wanted to spend my time as a student, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So that's how I showed up the first day of, uh, of my fall quarter. And there's a funny story about what happened next. The class was taught by a young mathematician who's named Peter Sarnak. He's now an older and very distinguished mathematician. And the first day, uh, there were 90 students. And Professor Sarnak walked in, he was wearing a leather jacket, and he immediately started writing on the blackboard. And I had no idea what he was writing, and I just copied everything line by line. And the second day I came back, there were 60 students. It was exactly the same. And the third day I came back, there were 30 students. And Professor Sarnak walked in and he took off his jacket, and he stood in front of the class, and he said, this looks like the right size for the class. <laughs> and then he started teaching us calculus. And the whole experience was completely unexpected, and it led me to discover two things. The, the first was that there were a lot of people who were just much better than me at math. That was a good lesson. Uh, the second was that I'd never been in a class where I paid intense attention every day and I didn't understand things at all. And then I had to go back to the library and spend hours working through the problems to try to understand. And what I learned was that I really loved trying to figure out things that at first I didn't understand. And that put me on the path to being a researcher. Because that's what you do as a researcher. You find things that are important. In my case, it was things like how to run auctions for the government to sell wireless spectrum, for example, or how the healthcare system works, or what the effect of new technologies will be on the economy. Things that you don't understand, and you try to figure them out, and then you try to tell other people what it is that you've figured out. So later that same year, I had another unplanned experience that was also very impactful. And I was reminded of it also as I was hearing the students speak about some of their experiences the last few years. So it was toward the end of my summer after my freshman year, and a friend invited me to take a trip down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. And I had a few weeks free before school started, and so I figured, you know, why not? And the next thing I knew, I was in Arizona, and I was learning how to kayak, and it was 47 degrees in the water, and the waves were over my head. And I survived. Um, and I discovered that I really loved being out in the wilderness. And after that, I spent just about every weekend that I was in college in the mountains, often with some of the friends from that trip, climbing and skiing and, and kayaking. And I continued to do that for many, many years. It was really been one of the great passions in my life, even though since we had kids, I, I had to agree not to do anything dangerous anymore. And I have to say that because Amy's here. <laughs> and I think that um, all of you who are graduating you'll find many of the things that you love through serendipity. So it's really important to be open to possibility and to opportunity. Okay, the second point I wanna make is about patience and hard work. So research on happiness distinguishes between things that make us happy in the moment and things that give us long-term satisfaction. The latter come from doing things that are meaningful and that lead to a feeling of accomplishment and purpose but often aren't that pleasant at the time. And in our family, we call that type two fun. <laughs> okay, that's opposed to type one fun. Type one fun is enjoyable at the time. And all of you have just been through one type two experience, which was applying to college. So the experiences that I just talked about were serendipitous events. They were events that involved a lot of chance. But what happened next was not all chance. Because once you discover something that you want to accomplish, it almost always takes a lot of work and focus and determination, and also time. You know, here we live in Silicon Valley, and we hear a lot about people like Evan Spiegel, who started Snapchat, or Kevin Seistrom, who started Instagram, and these are people who became spectacularly successful, and they did it very, very quickly. And at Stanford, I sometimes worry that our students will see these very rapid success stories as an example, and they will feel enormous pressure that they need to achieve it themselves, and they shouldn't. For Phil Knight, he took his class on entrepreneurship and he started his shoe company, but it took about 20 years before Nike took off as a company, and initially he was just selling shoes out of the trunk of his car at track meets. 
And after I discovered that I liked studying, and even after I discovered that I liked economics, it took years to be any good at it. And I spent a lot of nights working until two or three in the morning as a student, and then as an assistant professor, and then as a full professor. And most of the time, it really didn't feel that I was making very much progress. But some over time, there were enough small advances that now I look back and I can feel some accomplishment. And the same was true for me with climbing and with kayaking. And it's even more true in the relationships that you develop. They also require an enormous amount of work and time and intentionality. But investing in them is what really pays dividends in the long run. OK, my last point is about responsibility. So during the last few years, all of us have lived through a tumultuous period in this country. And we've seen that the country and other countries around the world are divided, politically and economically and in other dimensions as well. And those of you who are graduating are going to start college, whether it's next fall or in a year or two. And you're going to do that at a time when that climate is having a significant impact on campuses. So at Stanford, where I work, we're asking ourselves not just about how to teach classes and conduct research, but about how we as an institution can best serve society and the world. We're asking, to what extent are we creating economic opportunity for a broad cross-section of students? How do we think about being globally engaged but serving our country? How do we manage diversity and inclusion? How do we prepare students for a world where there's an uncertain future of work? And we're grap grappling with a very difficult issue, which is one that I think this school has done a remarkable job addressing, which is how do you create a welcoming environment for students, but also foster challenging and open discussions, even discussions about controversial topics? So what will it mean for you to enter that environment? What will be your responsibility? Well, you'll need to be willing to speak up and foster debate, but also to listen and to be open-minded. And if someone disagrees with you, not to be angry, but to be curious. And that's not easy, but it's what it takes for schools and universities to serve their purpose. And it will be one of your responsibilities when you get to college. At Stanford, we also think about what we want to accomplish with our educational process, what it is that we want our students to be and to achieve. And of course, we want them to be successful professionally. And I do run a business school, after all. But even more importantly, we want them to contribute to society and to be a force for good in the world. Now, when I talk to my students at Stanford about this, I like to tell them a line from the Jewish liturgy. I like to tell them Rabbi Tarfan's saying from the Pirkei Avot. It's a very important saying in my home when I was growing up. And it's a line I think many of you will know. It's when the Rabbi Tarfan says, it is not up to us to complete the work, but neither are we free to avoid it. And of course, the work of perfecting the world cannot be completed. But we do all have the obligation to take it up, whether it's through leadership or through service or through acts of kindness and goodwill. So in closing, I've talked about the importance of serendipity and being open to possibility and about how accomplishing things that are meaningful usually does not come quickly or easily. And finally, about the responsibilities that you'll have as you set off on your next adventures. And I started out by saying that at the business school, I have the opportunity to meet people who've been very successful in their careers. And it's great fun to meet those people. And they're inevitably very, very impressive. But in truth, the people who are the most impressive are the ones who consistently elevate others, who lift up their families and their friends and their communities and people in need of help. And I hope all of you will be those people when you get where you're going next year and in your lives. Thank you for the opportunity to speak.